Hey everyone, and welcome back to another Security Topics video. Uh, today's topic is Unicode normalization attacks. Um, so this talk is inspired by this challenge. Uh, this is from Imaginary CTF. If you don't know Imaginary CTF, you should check it out. Uh, it's just a month-long CTF. It runs every month, um, and they post very interesting challenges. Uh, the people that write the challenges are next-level smart. Um, so if you're looking for something fun to do every month, I uh, highly recommend it. Um, but this particular challenge is written by Lidexon, I think. Uh, it's called PyGolf, or PyGolf. It was in the Miss Challenge. And it's only two lines of code. Uh, it defines a flag, and then it's going to eval eight bytes of input, or eight characters of input. Um, so very simple to understand, but very hard to actually execute. And so the idea is you would netcat to this port, and somehow you have to leak the flag. Um, and you can't just eval flag, uh, which seems too obvious. If you eval flag, it doesn't get returned to you. So flag is evaled, but it's not printed. Um, so... But uh, very fun challenge. Uh, I love these challenges that are simple but hard. Um, I didn't solve it, uh, so I was able to, if you click the little write-up button on the website, it'll tell you what the solution is. Uh, and the solution involves uh, Unicode normalization. Um, so anyways, that's why I decided to do some more research into this topic. And I have a favorite cheese, which I'll talk about too, uh, which is another reason I was excited to dig into it. But uh, for the rest of this talk, we're going to give the briefest of inf introductions to Unicode. We're going to talk about my favorite uh, PyGL cheese called Breakpoint Bypass. Um, or that's what I call it, but really it's just that, that B. We're going to talk about Unicode normalization, then we'll give the solution to the challenge we just saw and talk about some related ideas for other CTF challenges. Uh, so like I said, this is not a full uh, introduction to Unicode, um, but anyways, uh, Unicode, it's like this character encoding scheme. I think that it's like actually a family of different encoding schemes, um, but if we think back, uh, I would assume most people are familiar with ASCII. Um, if not, there's the original, I don't know if I, original is the right word, but there's a character scheme for English letters anyways called ASCII. Um, and the idea is that we have characters, but computers don't recognize characters. They work on bits and bytes and stuff. And so if we want to represent the letter C, that is actually the number 67 stored as a byte within our computer. Um, and so as an American, much to my surprise, it turns out there are other languages in the world. Um, and to represent those, we can't put every single character in the world into a single byte. So we need a new scheme that can represent every single character uh, for every single language or letter in every single language. Um, I think it's also called glyphs. So anyways, Unicode is uh, the solution to that problem, or I think there were many different competing efforts and there's a whole history, I'm sure, but uh, I think we've kind of settled on Unicode, uh, specifically UTF-8, which I'll talk about in a second, um, as the way to kind of represent all the different characters and glyphs and letters and ligatures and all that fun stuff. Um, so a core component of Unicode are these things called code points. Uh, this is how we actually uh, think of the individual glyphs or letters or characters. Um, so we assign each unique character, I guess, um, a code point, and it is just some number that represents that character. Um, and they just kind of increment starting from zero and they go all the way up to however many we need. Um, so for the ASCII letters, the letters we were just looking at in the man ASCII table, um, they have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, but as we get into like bigger characters, like there's the poop emoji unicorn uh, pile of poo. So uh, emojis are also uh, have their own code points within um, Unicode. The code point for pile of poo is uh, 1F4A9. Um, so if we want this Unicode character, uh, we can go Python 3, and we'll print it out. Uh, oops. And to do this, we need to add a couple of zeros, and there we go. So this Unicode character, when we convert it, uh, we're going to talk about different encodings in a second, um, will be encoded to a form that this terminal understands, and we get the poop character. Um, but anyways, so each... Unicode character has a corresponding code point. Um, so that's idea number one. When we actually want to represent them, um, we might have noticed that if we take this, uh, we have this uh, this code point. This is not equivalent to how the bytes are actually stored. Uh, this is just a number we use to identify this character, but how this character is stored is very different. Um, so if we want to look at how this character is stored, uh, we can do this um, and code. And we can see these are the bytes under the hood. So this character is represented by four bytes. And we can see there is some overlap with the code point right here. But we can see this is a 92 here and 9F here. And so I'm almost certain this is using UTF-8 encoding uh, by default. And we'll kind of talk about that here. Um, so it's four bytes. Uh, so it when we encoded it, we encoded it using UTF-8. That's just one of those forms. So we took that code point number. And if we actually follow this conversion table, uh, it is a larger number. It started with a 1, I believe. Uh, yep, we can see it starts with a 1, so it goes into this character encoding. So a bunch of high bits are set, which is why if we look back here, we can see like Fs and F9s are all set. Um, and the code point uh, number is like split among all of these like lower bits in each of the bytes. 
but anyways, that's how we convert from a code point to a the actual bytes in UTF-8. But I said there's multiple different encodings. Uh, UTF-8 is, I think, the most popular one, but there's also UTF-16 and UTF-32, and UTF-8 can be between one and four bytes. So if you're just doing ASCII, every character is represented by one byte. Um, but if you're doing UTF-16, it's between two and four. And if you're using UTF-32, this is a fixed width encoding. And so it is four bytes. Um, also fun on this Unicode stuff, uh, like I said, there's different encodings. And to differentiate, if you have a blob of text, to differentiate what type of encoding you're using, uh, there's this thing called byte order marks. And so if you have a stream of uh, bytes and you're not sure what encoding it is, sometimes you can look at the start. And if it starts with an EFBBBF, you know it's UTF-8. Uh, some A lot of times, or I should say a lot of times, sometimes it's not there. And I think a lot of times for, like, for UTF-8, it's not there, I think. Um, but uh, sometimes it is, and that's useful. So if you see an FEFF, you know it's UTF-16. There's also little endian and big endians, and they can be swapped. Um, but anyways, fun stuff. So now that we kind of know what Unicode is, um, so we can talk about one of my favorite cheeses, and that is the breakpoint bypass. Um, and really, it's just a it doesn't have to be breakpoint. Uh, so let's. Uh So uh, it's pretty common to have a pi gel kind of like this. This is a way simplified one, uh, but we can imagine it's going to, again, take some input. So we get to pass in, you know, a string or, or a series of bytes into the C variable. Uh, then it does some sort of, usually some sort of blacklist checking. Uh, this is just a generic pi gel challenge, and it's going to make sure that, you know, your character is not equal to breakpoint or exec or eval or import OS, you know, a whole list of things. Um, and if it doesn't hit anything in that, uh, that blacklist, um, it'll eval it. Um, and sometimes it's not even intentional. Uh, it just happens that people don't know to check for this. Um, but a very easy way to kind of cheese past this is instead of passing the string breakpoint, we can pass the string breakpoint. And I guess I should probably maybe explain what breakpoint is in case you're not familiar. Uh, but in Python, breakpoint is kind of how you activate the uh, debugger. So you can see I typed in breakpoint down here. Now I'm in the debugger. And once you're in the debugger, uh, you can do whatever you want. So if I want to do this... I can open up system and start shelling out and doing whatever I want. So if you can get shell, obviously you win uh, the challenge. Or if you're an attacker, obviously if you have shell in the box, that's very bad. Um, so if we can do this breakpoint thing, uh, it is a very fun cheese. And so the cheese for this is we're not allowed to use the string breakpoint or pass this. Um, and again, I'm simplifying this. You know, you should imagine there's a lot of other checks in here. Um, and so the trick is to use this very weird Unicode B. Um, so if we run the script, I'm going to press pass breakpoint. Uh, this is not allowed because you know it's an exact string match, but if I pass breakpoint with this like upper or this uh, accented B, um, it does work. And so from here again, we can do the OS dot system. Um, so strange. So for some reason, Python allows this very weird B uh, in breakpoint. Um, I knew about this exploit uh, thanks to Maple. Um, I forget what CTF it was, but. Uh, they put it on their blog at some point, and I was blown away by it. Uh, and I've used it, like I said, on a lot of CTFs, so it's just a nice little cheese. Um, but I didn't really know how it works under the hood. And it turns out it also is related to the CTF challenge we saw earlier, and it's this Unicode normalization. So it turns out Python, um, I'll go back to the slides, uh, does some normalization on literals uh, so that uh, you can do better comparisons. Um, and so Python, whenever they parse a literal uh, through eval or through the, uh, the, the prompt, they do something called NFKC. And this is one of the four normalization algorithms. Um, and it is normalized form compatibility composition. These algorithms are a little bit complex um, and hard to keep straight. But uh, the idea is that we need a way just to be able to compare two Unicode strings. Uh, and so when Python you know, does its comparison, first it's going to perform this algorithm. And it happens to be that a lot of characters get changed from one form to the other. Um, there's this canonical. These first two are both canonical and the second are compatibility. Uh, canonical usually means like an exact match and compatible usually means that like, you know, kind of like they're roughly equivalent um, is the way I'm thinking about it anyways. And so this, the, uh, we're doing a compatibility comparison uh, or compatibility uh, normalization. And so this B is pretty much a, a B and so it gets converted to a B. Um, and that's why we get breakpoint. But when it's doing the string comparison uh, within our code here, uh, it hasn't been normalized yet, and so that's why it doesn't or does pass this check. Um, cool. And so again, why is this normalization stuff uh, important? Well, uh, maybe this is more obvious for non-English uh, speakers, but uh, we can imagine. I, I usually go by Conrad online, and so if I just one day decided I wanted to add a e with an accent to my name, it turns out there's two different ways I could do this. Um, I could either uh, use the e accent character, and if we look here. 
Uh, this is the character, so there's just a Unicode character, E accent, or Latin small letter E with a cute. Or I can actually use the letter E and then use a Unicode accent character by itself. Um, and so that is this. Uh, this is just the combining acute accent character. And so I can put an E in here and then add the accent on top. But I think most people, oops, most people would agree that either way, how I define this, uh, they should be equivalent. Uh, it shouldn't matter if I'm doing E accent or the E accent character itself. Um, and so that's one of the reasons to use normalization. Um, and we can see here, uh, this is just a little Python script. So I do the normalization of Conrad with the accent E and then Conrad E within the accent character. And we can see that if I normalize them with uh, uh, the code using the Unicode data normalization function, um, they're now equivalent. So cool, um, it's the same uh, and all is happy. I also found this table on this uh, the Unicode official website. They have these reports, and they can kind of they kind of show the difference. So, anyways, uh, how does that help us solve the original CTF challenge? Um, so, if we go back, uh, there's actually two different things we needed to do for the CTF challenge. Uh, so, let's go to Python three uh, chow. Uh, we need to first uh, it needs to be small, and we also need to leak the flag somehow. Obviously, uh, the most obvious way to do this would just be to print the flag. And we can do that. It's just print takes, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven characters. <laughs> so that if we wanted to print it, it only leaves one character for the flag um, or, or some other trick. So uh, definitely a little bit tricky. Uh, it's very long. Uh, so maybe there is a smaller way to print. Uh, and it turns out there is, and that's by abusing a error handler. So if we actually pass in int i, actually, I think I can only do one character. Int h, uh, one, two, three, four, five, looks good. Uh, we can see that it was unable to parse this as an int because it's not an int and it tells us what it was trying to parse. And so if this was a longer string, it would print it all out. Um, so instead of using print, we can use int and we save you know, two characters, which when we only have eight characters, uh, that's a 25% savings. And it turns out the second trick is to abuse something called font ligatures. Um, so let me open this up. So it turns out Unicode has a couple of characters uh, where it is two characters combined into a single character. Uh, and specifically, they have this FL Unicode character. So this FL character is a single Unicode character, uh, but when it gets normalized, it becomes two characters. Um, so when it does the original length check, uh, it's going to pass as one character, but then when it actually gets eval and executed, it's parsed as a uh, literal, and at that point, um, it'll become two characters. And specifically, since it starts with FL, uh, that's very useful for the keyword flag, um, we can use it to uh, leak the flag. So I'm gonna place it in there. You can see it's very close together instead of FL, uh, they're kind of joined together. But I can do int FL AG. And so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight characters. If I hit enter, uh, we get out the flag, ICTF fake flag. Uh, so super cool stuff. Um, this little font ligature uh, allows us to combine two characters into one. Uh, and then when it gets normalized, they get split back out. Um, it doesn't look like you can do it for a lot of characters um, within Unicode. Uh, there is a, a fun CSS attack, uh, an XS leak um, using font ligatures and uh, pushing elements off of the page so you can get a, a callback doing a CSS leak. Um, if you're curious, there's a, a Reddit video there. It's like one of my first videos actually, um, but that's a different topic. But anyways, that's the solution. And there were some you know, beginnings of Unicode normalization. Uh, there's a couple of other related attacks. Uh, there's this amazing uh, blog article here uh, it's called uh, Bypassing WAF Unicoding. Uh, but they give a bunch of examples of very interesting Unicode characters that get normalized into uh, something very useful. Um, so we've probably seen these before. Uh, so there's the double dot character. Uh, and sometimes this can be normalized into dot dot, which is very useful for doing directory traversals. Uh, they also show some SQL injection. So we can see this is a very weird quote character that might be normalized into a, I guess, a normal quote character. Uh, same with slashes for doing comment characters. Um, there's numerics, so there's like these numbers with a circle around it, uh, which could be used for integers, which is pretty interesting. Um, there's periods, slashes, uh, X's. Uh, we'll talk about one of these in, again in a second. Uh, different template injections. Um, a lot of interesting characters. I'd highly re recommend checking this blog post out. Uh, but you can see uh, there's a, a lot of interesting things to test for with uh, Unicode injections. Um, in terms of another kind of related attack is uh, account takeovers. Uh, so if you can normalize, so you can imagine if you have a website where you can register with a name and then later they do a username check, but they call too lower, depending on when that validation happens, uh, you might be able to kind of collide two different usernames into the same username. 
Um, and if the username or the email or whatever is the primary identifier, you might be able to use that to take over accounts. Um, there was a very fun uh, CTF challenge, uh, Iris CTF, um, Pwn Michael Bank, um, a video there where we had to, I think it was in Java, uh, and you were able to collide two usernames using one of these special characters. So this, this special character, uh, when you convert to uppercase, actually turns into two characters. But using this, and the, the, in general, this problem is called the Turkish, I guess, I problem. Uh, you can uh, do some trickery fun stuff. Uh, there's also, I remember there was a pwn challenge. I don't remember where, um, but it was a buffer overflow where you were giving it a bunch of input. And then when you converted it, it would do a length check and then it would convert it to uppercase, I think. And, uh, when you did that, if you have a special character like this, where it has a length of one and then it's converted to a length of two, um, you were able to get that buffer overflow because they weren't doing bounds check. Um, I don't remember where it was, but that was another one. And then, then at some point there was a miss challenge where they just wanted something basically just abusing this exact thing where you sometimes you can have a one character be converted to two characters or more uh, when you do an uppercase check. Um, there's also cases of partial differentials with the uh, related to browsers. Um, so there's this uh, pretty fun Google CTF writer from 2017 uh, where uh, you were able to pass uh, ASCII into DOM Purify, and DOM Purify is a very good, very good XSS sanitizer. And so you're able to get DOM Purify to uh, sanitize as ASCII, but the browser, you could trick it into rendering UTF-16. Uh, and because of that, uh, depending on how you spaced out your characters, you can get your XSS to pop. Um, and very related, there was a integrity CTF challenge uh, for February um, where they abused a very similar thing. Uh, this write-up is done by CryptoCat, so you know it's good. Sweet, and that's it. So in conclusion, we talked about Unicode. We talked about the, uh, the little breakpoint bypass that I like, uh, what normalization is and what it looks like in Python. We talked about the solution to the PyJail. Uh, using uh, uh, font ligatures, and then uh, some related CTF challenges and topics. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, in terms of other resources, if you're curious, uh, there's that blog article I mentioned. Uh, I thought it was really good. Uh, I found this Black Hat talk called Host Split, where they talk about uh, Unicode normalization. Um, so you, you might may or may not know that domains use uh, Punicode. I don't know how to actually pronounce it, Punicode, um, for Unicode. Uh, and so that's why you see that XN stuff in the domains every once in a while. Um, but sometimes if they, this person was able to uh, use trick domains by using this, I think this is accounts receivable Unicode character or something, but when it gets normalized into a slash, you can trick a domain into be treated as a smaller domain with a slash and a path. Uh, so very interesting stuff and pretty fun. Um, and then there's this huge article, to be honest, I did not read it. Um, maybe in the future I'll read it, but it looked very technical and very difficult, but it was called the Unicode Technical Report, Unicode Security uh, Considerations. Uh, I skimmed over it. It looked like a lot of the stuff we had been talking about it, but a lot more depth. Um, so if you're interested in going into extreme detail, uh, I'd recommend checking that out. Um, yeah, that's it. If anyone has any ideas for future topics, uh, let me know. Uh, there's a Discord link below. Uh, feel free to go in there. If I said anything wrong, please let me know too. Um, and yeah, thanks for watching. Cheers.